Hi, this is Mike O'Brien, International Director for the Fire and Life Safety Section with the International Association of Fire Chiefs. And today is our first presentation as part of our multi-series or our multiple uh, classroom portion as part of an overall uh, program working with NEMA as it relates to fire alarm systems. Joining with me today is Chief Andy King, the Chair of the Fire and Life Safety Section. And we want to go back to the basics. We know as firefighters, fire inspectors, fire marshals, uh, starting with the basics is so important. And when we want to start talking about fire alarm systems, we have to go back and remember sometimes why or how our buildings are reacting to fire and what might cause a system to be activated. So today we're going to talk about the principles of fire, and you may remember some of this from your basic fire academy class. So Chief King, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Mike, I appreciate it. All right, our learning objectives for today, this is presentation should be about 10 minutes or so. But if you remember back to uh, fire principles, we start with the fire triangle. Depending on when you learn this, it would have been the fire triangle or the fire tetrahedron. The fire tetrahedron is technically the most correct. Second, we'll follow into the stages of fire development, followed by the classifications of fires, and finish with a short Q&A session. Now, Andy, one of the things I think about is fire prevention. Sometimes we've got to understand that fire tetrahedron, right? Because we truly hope with our fire alarm systems that it's doing a couple things for us, and it's really trying to keep that fire small so that early notification helps us. But when you look at the tetrahedron, right, we have fuel, heat, that chemical chain reaction, chemical chain reaction, and oxygen, right? So we have to have a source of ignition, we need to have a material that can be ignited, and we have to have enough air to sustain that fire. And when we put them all together, right, we have a fire. Now, when we think fire prevention, sometimes we talk about, hey, well, how do we keep a fire small? So removing combustibles um, from a mechanical room or removing combustibles near an ignition source may be one way to break that tetrahedron. Or more importantly, you know, we put a fire rating, maybe it's a firewall, a fire separation, and the intention there is to help keep that fire small and limit its size. But really when we think fire prevention, one of the basic com components is allowing this tetrahedron or the process to never get to it, right? So if we have an open flame source, we don't want uh, storage near it or we want to remove a fuel source. So when you start to look, when you think fire prevention in the stages of development or that incipient stage, what comes to your mind, Chief King? I was really focusing on prevention, thinking about the chemical chain reaction. Because to me, that's one of the obscure ones, but we have a lot to do with that, with any of our clean agent systems that get installed, whether it be in a clean room, or that's your um, FM200 and other similar um, agents. Just thinking back to our basic fire academy, but that incipient stage, um, you know, are you seeing many fire alarm systems activate in this incipient stage? I have to remember that the smoke for, for an alarm system to activate, typically the smoke has to be dangerous smoke. And so that's a, I, I say it's a trick question in that sometimes in, we go to house fires where we have a little bit of smoke, but yet the smoke alarm in my house may not activate, but it's not really considered dangerous. The flip side is on a commercial system with a smoke detector, they may be more sensitive. They may still respond similarly. So uh, I think the point is we're still getting the automatic alarm coming in during that first stage, the incipient stage of fire. In many of times in the incipient stage, it could be the activation of our fire alarm system from somebody seeing a small fire, recognizing and manually activating the system, you know, through a manual pull station um, while they're maybe going forward. But really that incipient stage for us is that reminder is little smoke, um, it's a low heat output. Um, a little different as we transition to that next stage, that smoldering stage. It is. That, that stage, you have a lot more uh, smoke obscuration, which should definitely set off most smoke detectors at that point. And then as we get uh, start looking at more advanced devices, we recognize that they may have dual sensing technology or combination devices such as carbon monoxide. 
And I think many of us on the far side know that as we get more advanced fire, we're going to start to see that heat level increase, which really then takes us into typically that flaming stage that fully developed. We see a lot of flame. Uh, combustion uh, is relatively complete. Um, and so we start to see adjacent things catching on fire um, as we get into typically that fourth stage or that heat flash over stage. Definitely the most dangerous stage. It's really the point of no return. At that point, the alarms should have already activated. Obviously, sprinklers should have already activated and sounded an alarm as well. But this is the stage where if you don't have those things working or they're not in place, especially in our homes, that we recognize that the fire is going to grow exponentially and uh, it's time for significant intervention at that point. Kind of just reviewed, you know, the, the phases of fire. And I think as fire service folks, we typically are very, we see that a lot in the residential setting, maybe not as much in the commercial. Um, but right, that's how we want our fire alarm system to be set up, that early notification to keep that fire small. Because really, once we get to that last phase, um, that's a significant fire development that, um, you know, it, it makes our jobs harder as responding firefighters. Um, and it be, just becomes more dangerous. So, you know, one of the basic things that we also need to review is just the classification of fire. So class A is that ordinary combustible materials, wood, paper, cloth, um, you know, maybe some plastics. You know, class B, we start to get into flammable or combustible liquids. Class C obviously is typically a class A fire, but it involves energized electrical equipment. So the idea is to kill the electricity beforehand before extinguishing it, but there are also different types of extinguishers that can be used on Class C, obviously, in a safe way. And then uh, Class D is the final one, which involves combustible metals. Um, typically, we all think of magnesium, magnesium engine fires, but those are metals that typically can't be extinguished with water, or if, if they are, you have to be very careful. And as we kind of recap, you know, as we start to prepare this uh, month long series on truly getting the tools in the hands of our responding crews um, on fire alarm systems, our, our goal is to make sure that we give that comprehensive approach. So the basics, right, we're developing a fire alarm system in many cases, whether it's in the building or fire code or the buildings engineer or the fire alarm engineer is to address the basic principles, not only what's required in code, but are they putting a system in that's going to help us uh, respond to a fire? And so the first things we need to remember is that fire tetrahedron, right? We've got fuel, that chemical uh, chain reaction, heat and oxygen. And the goal truly is, is as that process is forming that that fire alarm system activate. And Chief King, as you look through the stages of fire development, um, can you recap that for us and maybe tell us how you think it interacts with the fire alarm system? The stages of fire development, the incipient stage, that's where we really have a great opportunity to catch the problem. It's the very first one. That's where we'd like to recognize it as soon as possible. But we also don't want to have false activations either. So that's the key. The smoldering stage is increase or decrease of oxygen, which lowers the rate and spread of burning and the fire is definitely becoming more dangerous from a life safety standpoint. Uh, the third stage is flaming again, which means it's either created a way to get more oxygen or enough heat that it's burning those hot um, gases off that were created during that smoldering stage. And then finally, once you have enough of the free burning, uh, the room's ultimately gonna reach enough temperature and heat so that the room flashes over all at once and becomes very dangerous. And so recognizing how we can catch those as early as possible is, is critical. We have the four types of fire, class A, B, C, and D. I think most of um, our responding crews are typically seeing class A with an occasional B. We turn off that power on a C and it quickly becomes a class A. And then obviously there's those metal fires, those class Ds hanging out there. And, you know, really a couple things maybe just as we start to talk through fire alarm systems and their integration, you know, common uh, system interaction, and, and we talked about it earlier in today's class, was in that class C, we see a lot of special fire suppression systems 
with attached alarm systems as it relates to computer server rooms. And that's a very much a frontline response that many of our crews are going to see. So we have early detection. So we talk about those small fires, um, maybe in that incipient phase where it activates a smoke detector in a panel and it creates some form of a response, whether it's alerting building occupants, alerting the fire crews, and then we get into uh, even shutting down the power and shutting down the system. So the beautiful part that we're going to start to explore over the next couple of weeks as we go through uh, the, various, the various phases of a fire alarm system, we're going to talk about fire alarm control panels, notification systems, uh, interaction to other building systems, voice evacuation, uh, and we really have some experts. And, um, you know, how does that fire alarm system interact with that building, interact with the occupants, and interact with the fire crews? And that's really what we're going to start to explore over the next handful of weeks. And, and Chief King, I, I have one question for you. I know that um, it keeps coming up is, how can our responding fire apparatus crews work to reduce um, false alarms? So what is the role of maybe the responding crew versus what is the role of um, the fire marshal's division in reducing false alarms in their community? I can speak from experience is that what we've learned is that we don't cancel going to automatic alarms anymore. It's probably been the biggest change we've had over the last 20 years is that we make sure that we investigate, provide good customer service. And if we investigate the alarm, figure out what the problem is, we can either ask the responsible to take care of it or at least forward it to your fire prevention office so that we can follow up and hopefully not have repetitive alarms. So to me, that's uh, the biggest key. Once our responding crews have their eyes open that they are an integral part of communicating what they're seeing back to the fire marshal so they can take action. However, your department structured is, is such a key because um, you can see if you can go into any fire department across the United States and, and, and you hear that automatic alarm come in, you'll see their eyes roll. They probably know the location. They know exactly what they're going to do. And quite honestly, you know, from a fire chief perspective, we want to keep our rigs in service. We don't want them going to these generic alarms. And there's so much we can do when there's great quality communication, right? So communication from the crews of what they're seeing, hey, it's zone six manual pull station. Every time it's zone six manual pull station, then the fire marshal and his gang or her gang can come in and work with the building owner who should be getting with the um, alarm service company because that they're the experts. And so bringing them all together is such a pivotal part, I think, in trying to keep those alarms down. Hopefully this segment was a good primer and review for everybody. And we'll get into some really good stuff here in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I'm excited. So thanks for your time today, Chief King. And uh, I hope you have a great day and we will see you next week. Uh, we're going to be joined with our friends uh, Richard Roberts and Dan Finnegan representing the Farm Life Safety of NEMA. And we should have a great conversation diving into fire alarm systems. Have a great day, everybody.